Hi, and welcome to week two, part one. And today we are going to talk about environments. The reason why we're going to address this is that when you start programming, you're going to come across the term environments a lot. And it's one of those terms that is very broad and general and doesn't really say anything uh, when you're looking into it from the outside. Um, once you've programmed a bit and you um, you have that experience, you know what it means. But as a beginner, it's a really difficult term to get your head around and to understand. And it doesn't make it easier that the term changes depending on the context. Um, you can use that word and depending on um, the broader sense or, or what you're uh, using it with, it changes. So to help you uh, not feel so confused when you come across that, this term environments, um, we wanted to give you a little, a little rundown of what uh, that term means and discuss it a little, a little bit. So when you do come across it, you've heard it and you have an inkling of what it could be. So without further ado, let's uh, get into environments. So an environment is a combination of all the hardware, all the software and all the settings to that, uh, that is necessary for your code to run. And different environments come with differing, different, different settings, different characteristics, different um, applications, um, depending on the context and what you want to do. Um, hence the confusion, because while the term environment is broad and always does mean the same thing, depending on what you want to do, um, what that environment might consist of changes um, case to case. So the environment of the underlying hardware, that's just the physical components of your computer. Um, for example, if you work with a Mac computer, you can uh, build programs and applications for Mac and iPhone. But if you're sitting on a Windows computer, you can't build for those. So then you have a hardware environment that is either Mac or Windows. So that is one of the characteristics or one of the components of an environment. But you also have operating systems that are the software foundation level of the environment. So if you are if you're on a Mac computer, you are sitting in a Mac OS environment. So not only does the environment change depending on the hardware, it changes depending on the soft uh, on the operating system on top of that. If you are using a PC, then you are sitting in a Windows environment. So the operating system also plays a part in all of those settings and characteristics that make up the components and the settings um, of, a pro of a programming environment. The idea behind operating systems is that their general purpose, so it shouldn't really matter um, what operating system you're using. Most languages, with some exceptions for very closed um, architectures such as Mac and uh, the programming language uh, Swift. But most of the time, uh, the operating system is just the foundational layer. It enables you to use your computer as normal. It makes uh, it takes care of all the telling the hardware what to do. And it's just the springboard um, that you leap from to start programming. And it might surprise you to learn, because it was surprising to me, that you can't just sit down and code if you know a language. Because the operating system is general purpose, it, it doesn't have the capabilities of running your code or understanding your code. So you actually have to download the language that you're going to use. So when you download that language, it comes with, say, a dictionary um, so that the, co the language itself gets translated into a format that your computer understands and then can execute your instructions, your code. 
So not only do you need to download the language so that there's something to interpret your language into a format that your computer can understand, you also need to download a runtime environment. So here we're adding another term there. So the runtime environment is a bunch of settings and uh, help programs that you also download separately from the language that allows your code to um, run and be tested on your computer. And the runtime environment is um, tied to your specific uh, language choice. So for example, if you work with JavaScript, which a lot of you will do, you need to run, uh, download the runtime environment node. So you might download the language of JavaScript, you might start uh, coding, but because you don't have the runtime environment, your computer won't be able to try out the code, you won't be able to test it. So that is another um, package of settings uh, underlying um, help code uh, that allows um, what you write to run on your computer. In short, the runtime environment um, t takes away a lot of headaches for you as, as a coder because it uh, makes sure that um, everything that's needed for you to run your language, hence the name runtime environment, uh, gets taken care of and you don't have to manually adjust anything, um, fiddle with settings uh, and make sure to set up uh, your computer in a way so that your code can run. The runtime environment sits on top of the operating system. Uh, so we have the hardware, the operating system, the runtime environment, and then the programming language over here that you work with within this runtime environment. And then the programming language and all the help here communicates with the uh, operating system and the hardware so that the hardware can uh, perform your instructions, your code. So. What it does is it eliminates a lot of um, work for you. If you think of it this way, it's kind of like either if you're building a house, it's like uh, not making your hammer uh, and nails yourself and not molding them, heating the metal. You can just um, get the necessary tools and you don't need to know how the hammer is made or the nail is made. Uh, you don't need to go out and um, chop down trees to have wood. You get that in a package and you don't need to know how that was done. You don't need to know how to make the tools that you use. Um, so it makes, makes it possible for you to focus on writing your code and that the computer and your code can communicate with each other. Another thing that is uh, really good about runtime environments is that it uh, provides a reliable and stable execution environment. Another term, another environment. But what that means is that if I have a Windows uh, computer and I install a runtime environment, if I want somebody else to use that code, no matter the software, the underlying hardware, if they have the same runtime environment, they're going to have the same settings, the same um, setup for my code to run. Um, so it's going to behave consistently across platforms. So if I'm writing a server, um, I can install a runtime environment and it's going to behave a certain way. And when I have the computer that's going to act as my server, no matter what it looks like, the, the, setting, the, the settings and the specifications of that, as long as that runtime environment is installed on that server, the computer that's going to act as a server, my code is going to behave the same way. So it sort of makes it a, a, an intermediate, it's an intermediary to make sure that everything works the same way, no matter what goes, uh, what the underlying operating system or hardware is. And since we sit and code on our computers, and then that code is going to be somewhere, live somewhere else when users are going to start using our products, and we have no idea what those um, specifications and what those settings might be, the runtime environment uh, makes it possible that 
it, it just allows us to not have to deal with, uh, with those specific details. Um, so it just helps you to know that if I write my code in this runtime environment, as long as somebody else has that, that runtime environment, it's going to act the same way. Another type of environment is a virtual environment, a virtual machine. So essentially, you can fake a computer inside of your computer. Very, very cool. So how it works is that your, your operating system works on the basis and the specifications of your hardware. It's based on your processing power, on your hard drive, on all the capabilities that your hardware has. But in the same way, um, your operating system can take those settings and duplicate them, isolate that and create another computer, another machine. So this does take a lot of power because you have your operating system, your computer running on your hardware, and then you've duplicated it. So you have the exact same, uh, the exact same power and exact same memory that that's needed duplicated again. So it's twice the power that your hardware has to deal with. But this is really great for if you um, say you would download something that maybe you don't trust, then you can create a virtual machine and open up a program in your virtual machine. So if there's anything, a virus or something that's wrong with the, whatever you downloaded, your operating system is isolated from the compu computer that you created and faked. So if something goes wrong there, you can just shut it down and your original computer, not the one that you created, not the one you virtualized, um, but the one you're sitting with on a day-to-day -day basis, the one you use, that one is safe because these two environments, the virtual machine, the virtual environment, and the one you use every day are isolated and separate from each other. So this is also really helpful when we're trying to work with um, another type of operating system than the one we, we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, if you have a Windows computer, you can create a virtual machine and install uh, another operating system to try it out. For example, Linux. And to take it one step further, if you're going to write uh, code for servers, those are usually um, running on the operating system Linux. So if you have a virtual machine and you want to see how your code will um, behave in a, a Linux uh, environment with a Linux operating system, you can do that and you can try out commands and see how that operating system works. And you can insert your own code into that and then you know what it will what it will look like, how it will behave when you take your code that you wrote on a Windows machine and transfer it to a Linux machine. Because you've already tried it in your own faked Linux machine. So it's quite useful, uh, but it does take a lot of computational power. But that is another type of environment, a virtual environment. We are also going to talk a little bit about development tools and utilities. Now, these aren't environments per se, uh, but they are help and aid uh, and help you uh, write your code and help you manage your code. So for example, one type of uh, development tool is uh, help with debugging. Now, debugging is when you have something wrong with your code and you want to figure out what it is. But because code runs so fast, uh, you might press play or initiate your program and things will be happening so fast that you don't know what in your code corresponds to a behavior in your, in your program. You just can't figure it out because it's just so fast. So you can't see which line of code is creating the error. So what you can do with debugging is that you can specify the computer to stop, pause running the code at a certain uh, line in your document. So say that there's an error on line 29 uh, and you have an inkling that it could be there, but you're not quite sure. 
so you can tell, tell it to stop on line 28, 20, 29, 30 and choose whichever line you want. Um, so the code will go super fast down to uh, line 28 and then it will pause and then you can inspect um, what has happened so far, how does my code look, um, what is the state of um, certain settings in my code and then you can manually tell the computer, okay, I've, I'm done inspecting this line. Let's jump to the next line. And then you have control and you decide when the code is going to be executed. Um, so this is really, as you can imagine, helpful. And this is a tool, a development tool to help you um, find errors. So the next term uh, of environment, your development environment. Um, so your development environment is everything you need on your computer specifically to um, write your code. Um, be aware that I'm not talking about downloading the language per se, because that is needed to interpret the code, but everything you need so that you can have, so that you can sit down and write it. So the program that you're going to write it in, uh, debuggers to help you find errors, um, all the settings and everything you need so that you can double click on your code editor, um, open something up, start coding. Uh, that is your development environment. And again, this is um, varied across tastes and what people need it for and what people want to do. Um, there's some, there's a lot of different ways of setting this uh, up and make it specific to your needs and to your taste. So the main part of a development environment is going to be your, your code editor or your integrated development environment, another environment, um, but your IDE, integrated development environment. So the IDE is a, um, uh, I like to think of it and explain it as a word processor for code. It is more than that, but, but let's start with that. Uh, it is word for, for writing, uh, for, for programming. So you start it up and you have a document that allows you to write code. But it comes with a lot more functionality than, than just, just writing your code and allowing you to have a file open and typing. It, provides debuggers for you. So it helps you and has integrated into um, the software, the uh, IDE itself, um, the functionality of uh, debugging, finding errors in your code, pausing your code to inspect it. Um, it has, <clears throat> most of them have integrated finding uh, little add-on packages and programs that you can download in something called a marketplace. Um, you can, um, if we continue on with the word processor analogy, you can find spell check for your specific language uh, in on the marketplace. And there's a bunch of different utilities that uh, an IDE comes with integrated into the program itself. Just like human languages, uh, code has a lot of rules about how to write it. Uh, which order words should come in, um, how you should structure it, um, how you spell things, things like that. And uh, an IDE helps you along with that. So it can even suggest code for you. Um, since code is so structured and in a way strict in how it's, it's formatted and how it's um, the sequence of it, um, there's AI that has analyzed so many people's code and kind of uh, can in interpret your intention based on the probability of what you want to do. So if millions of programmers have written the two words that you start with, there's a high chance that you're going to want to do what they did next. Uh, and it can suggest um, what you might want to do through autocompletion. And not, not only that, um, it can help you uh, make your code easier to read and clearer to read by letting you know where you can, how you can format it so it's um, 
human readable so that when you go back and look at it you can understand it and see what you've done and without really getting into it and reading it several times and trying to understand what what your idea was visually you can look at it and and understand what's going on ideas also help you understand how your files and folders look uh, how your code is organized in files and folders and it does this by providing a view where you can see your entire project so say that you wanted to have an image on your website and you had a folder for images that that was my cat that you had a folder for images that um, you wanted to include on your website the IDE allows you to look at that folder structure and see where everything is uh, visually, which is very helpful. IDEs even have ways of helping you with something called deployment. So deployment essentially, practically, is the act of taking your code and transferring it to where it's going to be when users are going to be able to access your software. So. <clears throat> When you sit in code, you have it locally and nobody knows that it exists. So for users to be able to use the program or the website that you're building, it needs to be somewhere else and it needs to be ex um, accessible to people. Um, and the act of transferring your code to that place where your code's going to be stay so that people can access it, moving it is called deploying. IDs have built-in tools and help uh, to do that as well. IDs also have uh, a compiler in them. So that means that for those languages that need to be translated all at once into uh, a format that the computer can read, into machine code, they come equip equipped with that and help you along with that as well. So not only do they do that and translate your code into binary, into machine code, it also has um, tools and libraries, another vague general term, but it has bundles of code um, integrated into it that when you've compiled your code, those tools add on capabilities to make it into a finished program. So once you've translated your code into hu uh, machine code, it adds on top of that, with the help of the tools that, they, that the IDE contains, everything that's needed for somebody else to just get a hold of your program and open it on their own computer. Um, because just the act of compiling your code might not be, uh, might not be enough for somebody else to take your program, open it and run it. You, have, you need some more additional tools and additional settings, additional things that need to be um, done in, or, in order for somebody else to just have your program and be able to use it. So IDEs come built in with all of those tools, with all of those bundles of code that you add on top of the translated, the compiled program. And when it's done, when it's uh, translated and added on these tools and added on these settings, um, your program can you can give it to anyone and regardless of their setup regardless of their operating system regardless of anything they don't need your runtime environment they don't need an IDE either it's just a normal so to speak program that they can use and uh, open and execute so IDEs have a lot of it's not just a word processor for code it has a lot of additional tools that help you finish your code and turn it into software that's usable for other people. And the beauty of an IDE is that uh, all, of the, all of these tools, all of these capabilities and functionalities come in, they're, they're just there in one single program, one UI. You open it up and it's all, it's all there. Um, so it might look a bit complicated when you open it up for the first time and that is because it has so many functionalities, settings and things you can do with it. 
And not only that, there's tons of different IDs out there as well. So the one that you're probably going to be working with is VS Code. So VS Code is really uh, an industry standard. Um, sorry. Um, a lot of programmers have heard, of, or most programmers have heard of VS Code or even worked with, uh, in it. It's sort of this general purpose um, default IDE that most many people in the industry uses. But there are also IDEs that are specialized for specific languages. So that means that um, when they created those specific IDEs, they integrated into it um, how to do more advanced spell check for that specific language or more advanced auto completion for that specific language or ways to automate setting up um, common structures and common common um, ways of setting things up in that specific language. So not only does it have all of those things we've already mentioned, all of the capabilities for uh, formatting, for when you're writing it, uh, for deploying, for sending your code where it's going to live so that it's usable for other people, uh, debugging, uh, checking for errors, um, packaging and uh, finishing your program, turning your code into a program. Um, they've also, the people who develop those IDEs that are specialized for languages, add even more help for that specific language. Usually those uh, IDEs uh, you need to buy. Um, they're very efficient for if you specialize in a language, but they also, they help you so much that if you're new to programming, they might uh, help you so much that you kind of get, uh, it becomes a crutch. Um, it's helpful to have a general purpose ID in the beginning so that you get to learn the basics and the foundations. And if you're going, if you know you're going to, oh, I'm only going to be working with Java, well, then it's it's a really good idea to um, maybe go to a company or yourself um, have a subscription for an IDE that specializes in that language. But a lot of the help that it gives is stuff that you might need to learn as a beginner to even know that it exists. And there's not just those IDs out there. There are also IDs that are general purpose, that are still free, that are alternatives to VS Code. The reason why we uh, talk so much about VS Code is that the school uses it. It's such a common industry standard IDE. And since you're going to be learning, it's helpful to be working with the same IDE so that when you have a problem, your teacher or your employer or colleague or whoever uh, both know where to go to look for errors and you both know what functionalities uh, the IDE has. So not only can you uh, get all of these, but there's also something called extensions in an IDE. Now extensions are these add-on functionalities that you can yourself download and um, add on top of everything that an IDE comes with. Um, so, for example, say that you want to work with Python, then you can um, have an extension to help you with auto-completion for Python. Now, the reason that this isn't um, just included in the IDE to begin with is because if it's a general purpose IDE, then you don't want to cram a bunch of functionality in there that a big chunk of your users isn't going to use. If 50 percent uh it's 30 30 30 percent people using it for javascript python and c sharp um, then adding unnecessary help unnecessary code is going to slow the id down and make it less efficient and not um, flow as well when you're working with it so as a solution then you cut the id comes as a uh, sort of blank sheet of paper and then you as the programmer can download these extensions to add functionality on top of the baseline and there's a bunch of them really uh, 
some of the more fun ones is uh, uh, just the UI changes that you can make. You can look for extensions that um, color your uh, IDE and your code and just changes the look of the UI. Very simple one to begin with. Um, there's the spell check, so to speak, for different programming languages. There's um, extensions that um, change your icons so th uh, for folders so that you can see what's a folder and what's a file next to the name of it. Um, so you can just visually look at it and see instantly what it looks like instead of having to read and kind of understand um, from the context. Um, there's ones that let you know when you have uh, formatted something wrong or maybe if you've missed uh, uh, a period or a um, parenthesis uh, that lets you know that, hey, your code isn't going to run because you forgot to type this specific symbol. Um, and there's millions of them. Um, and going on to the marketplace, um, you can check those out yourself and it can be quite fun to browse through those. Now, when you go to the marketplace and you browse through those, you'll, you'll quickly notice that, um, say that you want a UI change, you'll quickly notice that the, the ones you uh, get when you type in a search term and uh, the results you get back, that there are some that's just very popular because they're so common that most people have them or a lot of people use them. Uh, and you can see how many downloads that has. But these extensions then are available to download in your IDE. So you open up VS Code and you go to extensions and it's like a little, a little Google search for these extensions. You have a search bar, you can search for um, uh, UI, uh, hit enter, and it's gonna give you a list of a bunch of extensions that you can install straight away into your IDE and try out and also uninstall if you want, very simply. So they're a really easy way to customize your look, but not just that, your, uh, your functionality to your specific language, to your specific needs, to what you want it to um, be able to do and how you want to work with it. So just go and have uh, a look and see what's out there. Maybe Google uh, top 10 extensions for um, VS Code and you'll soon figure out um, how much fun stuff there, there's out there that can help you uh, when you start coding. Now we're going to switch focus a little bit and explain another broad general term that people are going to be using a lot and that I probably used while well, talking about this, which is a package. So what is a package? A package is sort of like an extension, but not for an IDE. Um, a package is a bundle of code that you can download that is going to give you some type of functionality or tool. So for example, a package that you could download um, is to, um, when you have a runtime environment, like I said, that you need to uh, run your uh, run your code in your specific pro programming languages uh, language, um, that runtime environment, you download it as a package. So it's code that's put together that you can download to help you do stuff on your computer. Um, and like I said, that it, it's similar to an extension. That's because, because it adds functionality to your operating system, to your uh, software, to all the different parts of your, all the different softwares that make up the, your computer. So if you have your operating system and you have this tool and that tool, all of this is your um, software infrastructure because you have the operating system as the baseline and then you have this and you have this and then you have this. That's your infrastructure. By downloading packages, you add to that infrastructure on top of your operating system and it gives you additional functionality that you might not have um, just, just with the operating system itself. So package is a bundle of code that adds more functionality to your software infrastructure than you had before. So a simple example of a package could be uh, something called moment.js. So moment has a bunch of functionality when you're sitting in coding that helps you deal with calendars and times and dates. 
So imagine that you are creating an application that is going to handle a schedule. And then you would have to look at um, how, what date it is, how many days ahead, what week it is. And you would have to tell the computer, well, we are at week this, and then we had to add this many weeks depending on la 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 and so on and so forth. That is a lot of work that a lot of people um, would have to do manually. And um, if every person who creates a scheduling app uh, will would have to duplicate this code, write this code over and over and over again, and everyone's sitting and having the same issues that it's difficult. Like imagine just thinking about leap years. Um, so a package then, since so many people have this problem of dealing with times and dates, uh, packages help solve those problems. So you can download this package called moment.js and by following the instructions that come with the package on how to write your code to use, um, to use that package, you don't have to do it manually yourself. You could save so much time and effort and ener energy, stress and frustration, because this is a problem that is going to be recurring. So somebody created a tool to solve that problem. So when you download a package like that, it comes with instructions where it says, hi, in order to use me, you need to write your code like this. So say, for example, if you want to create a, a leap year, you would write, um, it would tell you how to, what to write in your code so that you could use a leap year in it. Um, and that is how packages can really help us along a lot, um, especially for these tasks that are tedious and sort of point pointless in the sense that they're not original. They're not, they aren't, they aren't necessary for you to be creative or solve a problem in a unique way or, or where you have to um, think outside of the box or, or do all the things that a human can do when we're creating software. If it's something like just dealing with time and date, it's really a um, menial task. So packages can help us deal with those so that we have the energy and time to spend on the things that we really need to, that we need to do to solve actual problems, to solve these problems that aren't menial, that aren't typical, that aren't uh, repetitive, that are unique and that require us to look at many different circumstances and um, think creatively with. So in order to uh, download packages, we have um, package managers. Uh, these are specific for languages. So for JavaScript, we have um, NPM. So that stands for Node Package Manager. It is connected to Node, which is the runtime environment that is necessary to run JavaScript. So it's a website. You go on, you can Google NPM and you will get to their website. There, there's a search bar there and there you can search for available packages. Um, let's say that you have a specific issue that you want to make something drag and droppable in your um, on your website, you want to have a, a little box that a user can click on and when it drags the mouse, the box follows along and when they release the mouse, the box stays there. This isn't something that, this is something that you would have to um, code manually. So then you can see, hey, maybe other people had this issue too. Maybe somebody else wrote this code before me, put it into a neat little package and I can download it and use it. Because if it, is, if it is these menial repetitive tasks and problems that a lot of people have, why reinvent the wheel? Of course, there's something to be said to solve um, problems in order, so, in order to understand and to learn and to grow as a coder, of course. Um, and sometimes it's good to reinvent the wheel so that you understand how a wheel works and is structured, right? But a lot of the time, um, it's just sort of, it's not gonna give you anything as a coder and it's not gonna make your code faster, more efficient uh, or better. So if there's a problem that you suspect that 
a lot of other coders have had, uh, you can go on to NPM in this case, packages and see, hmm, maybe somebody solved this problem and, uh, and put it up online so that other people could solve this problem just as fast. Now, there is something uh, to be wary of with package managers in general. That's, this is not uh, specific for NPM and for JavaScript. And that is that these packages are made by third parties. And that means that um, I, I could upload a package and you could upload a package. These packages, they aren't um, tested. They aren't um, monitored. They're not screened. Um, you can create a user and upload a package. And if you then download a package that some not very nice person has created, they could have malicious code. Um, this has become more and more common in recent years. Um, and there's a way to try to safeguard against that. So one thing you should do is look at how many people downloaded this package. It's not 100% uh, foolproof, but it is one indicator that a lot of people trust this or have used this. And another one is to see uh, how often it has been updated and changed. Um, if it's uh, continuously updated or if it's a stable version, um, then you can see sort of um, understand if something has been, been used, say, for three or four years and it has uh, 20 million downloads, well, then it could potentially be, be pretty stable and a lot of people trust it and have used it. So it's, it's been working pretty good. So that is one way of safeguarding. But again, it's, it's, very, it's not a bad idea to be cautious and to um, be wary of what you include in your code. Package, package managers are really helpful in that they help you manage the, package, the packages you download, they help you install them, they do all of this stuff um, behind the scenes. You, ha you have um, Node, you go on to uh, NPM and you can just download packages and they that kind of, that the process of making sure that the package is integrated into your setup and usable is taken care of and is done behind the scenes. And there are more than it's not just JavaScript that have um, package managers. Uh, Python, for example, also has one. That one is called PyPy, P Y P I. Uh, and it works in exactly the same way as uh, NPM. You have an environment, you have a package manager, you go online, uh, you, you Google PYPI, um, and you go to get to go to a website and you can search for the packages that you are interested in. Um, so there's so much out there that you could be using that you could um, include in your code to help you uh, along the way and make you a more efficient and um, effective programmer. Uh, there's also an art in finding and applying these packages creatively in your code. But remember to be wary of, um, of, the, of them as well so that you don't accidentally include a package that might have um, malicious code. Uh, as a little side note, um, there was a package that was used for Java on the server side, meaning um, for servers, those um, computers that hold the code for websites. Um, and it was a staple in uh, Java uh, website development. Um, it was something that everybody used and it was a sort of an, an obvious thing to a package to download. It was a standard that you would download this. And then, Years later, people found that there was a vulnerability in that specific package. Uh, yes. Uh, and it was pretty bad. Uh, it was pretty bad. Um, people felt like uh, this one package that was um, so standard, so default, that it was like the cornerstone of the internet and all of a sudden it just sort of cracked. Um, and this is the 
potential dangers with packages that since you don't know what's behind the scenes, you don't know what vulnerabilities and what, what issues could be there. And years down the line, it could be, oh, there was a, a way to um, hack this specific vulnerability because of this specific package. Now, this isn't to discourage you from using them. Please use them. This is to make you uh, aware of the fact that anytime you download somebody else's code, anytime you use somebody else's tools, anytime you use anything that you yourself ha haven't created and you can't look under the hood and read the code, understand it and inspect it yourself, you are putting um, things at risk. And that is just the way it, it is. Um, no pro one programmer is going to be able to write anything without getting the help of packages and and tools and third party party um, help it's just the way that our computer world works right now it's just not possible to know everything there's too much out there so you can't be an expert in every single area cat. um but you do have to be aware that um, you need to be on the lookout for, for these problems. And that is going to be a staple in your career as a coder, that you need to be on the lookout for um, vulnerabilities, potential risks, and make sure that the code that you include, um, as far as you can, as much as you can, um, won't years down the line be uh, a vulnerability to your application. Imagine if you had this Java um, package that I was talking about and you created Twitter and you included that package in there. That means that potentially uh, passwords could leak, um, anything could leak basically, and then you would have to take down Twitter. Um, so be aware that it is an issue and that you should be on the lookout, but don't be afraid to use them because everyone is going to be. So practice being wary and practice choosing which packages you are going to include. And lastly, we're going to just briefly discuss the, the concept of an online ID. Now, as I've said, with your environment in your computer, you need an operating system, you need a runtime environment, you need a development environment, you need to install the compiler or interpreter to, com to, um, to uh, translate your specific language. You also need to install the um, uh, language itself and you need to set it, set it all up and you need to have all the settings so that you can start writing your code and running your code to test it. So that is a lot of steps before you even write your first line of code. And that can be frustrating and it's not very fun when you just wanna try things out. So to solve that problem, there's, um, there are online IDs where you choose a language and the platform, the website itself, they have set up all of that behind the scenes and in a drag and drop, uh, um, not drag and drop, in a drop down menu, you can choose what language you want to program in and it opens up a window for you and you can just write and run your code. So it's not gonna be able to handle a lot of powerful code or a lot of long code, but it's super helpful when you're a beginner and you just wanna try things out or if you're not a beginner and you just wanna have somewhere to try code and run it without having um, an hour of setting up your computer so that it can run that specific line of code or that specific language that you want to you want to check out um, so whenever you want to just run some code or try a new language and see what it looks like there are online ids that just eliminate all of that setup for you uh, so that you can just uh, go and code so that was the video on environments. I hope it didn't make you more confused than you were before. Um, but what I hope that you take with you is that environment is a bunch of settings put together that enable uh, something to run and function the way it's supposed to be. 
So for a programming environment, it's everything, all the settings, all the uh, help, all the things you need to download, like the language itself and the interpreter or compiler to turn it into a machine code. Everything that's necessary so that you can run your code and test your code, that is an environment. An integrated development environment, an IDE, is everything you need to uh, have a space to write your code, to, to uh, check it for errors, to get some help to um, spell check in your specific programming language. So while the term environment is very uh, broad and applicable to many different things, what they all have in common is that it's a bunch of a bunch of software with specific settings that um, let you do the things you need to do. A virtual machine is an environment. A Windows computer is a Windows environment. An IDE is a integrated development environment. All of what all of these pieces of software have in common is that they come with specific setting settings. Um, tools, uh, p snippets of code that all work together to create a environment in which you can run your code, in which you can um, r r write it uh, and test it out and make sure that it behaves the way it's supposed to do. So as you're going to go into more and more programming, these terms that are broad and general, such as the term environment, are going to crop up. And they, similarly to the word environment, are going to be something different depending on the context. Um, package is one of those. Um, library. Um, a library and a package are very similar. They sort of do the same thing and people can use them very interchangeably. Uh, you have the word framework, platform. Um, the more you get in contact with these terms, the more they're going to make sense. Um, infrastructure is another one. I already used that term. Um, your computer infrastructure. Well, that is your operating system, your bundles of code here and there. Together, they create that infrastructure because they, they sit together in your hardware and they work together and, are, and affect each other. So that is why it's an infrastructure. So the more you get in contact with these terms, the more sense they're going to make. And it's okay if it's confusing right now. Um, believe me, it's difficult to explain. So I can understand that it's difficult to just grasp the notion. But I hope that you learned something about what an environment could be. Um, that it's a bit more understandable now. That it's understandable that it's the environment changes depending on the context in which it's used and what it's going to be used for and that you're a little bit less um, intimidated when you hear these general uh, purpose terms so thank you so much for watching this video and i will see you in the next one hopefully so bye